Sorry. Thank you for again um, lending us this work. Obviously, this is a series you've been working on for a very long time. It's never been seen before in the public, um, so we're very grateful for that. And obviously, this is going to touch on your deep interest in artistic creativity, color, as well as your own work. So. Please, take, take it away. away. <laughs> <laughs> thanks everyone for being here. And thanks to all of you at the church for making this whole show happen. Um, so <clears throat> I was thinking when Louise was speaking how our work is related and also opposite in a way where I've taken a print and dissembled it and made a weaving of it. And um, so at the uh, suggestion of Sara, I brought up a little show and tell action. <laughs> um, I found um, a print that I made that the color was wrong, so it was still lingering in my studio. But to give you an idea, I make a print, something about this size, on linen. And then I cut it in about half inch strips, which I then sew together to make a long cord. And um, on a small handheld loom that is warped with sisal, I um, start at random um, recreating the painting. So I'll just put this here. And I'll show you what I ended up doing, which is this. Mm. And um, I guess all of you have cleanish hands, right? <laughs> um, but um, so we were talking downstairs about the idea of chance, and I really um, am a big fan of randomness and what happens um, when you're creating something. And I think it's part, a major part of uh, what we celebrate by working with our hands and doing things um, manually, um, of how uh, irregular things can become. And um, I, as some of you might know, I spend a lot of time um, working with imagery related to nature. I'm a big hiker and love to be outdoors. And for a long time, I've been noticing how the trees and vegetation weaves with itself, um, especially if you walk in areas that are kind of wild and untrimmed. Um, things really start to mesh, and um, as fall starts to come now, the colors will start to change, and those weavings change because certain parts of it stay green and start to others disappear or turn orange. And I've been watching that kind of thing for a long time. And um, at one point, I worked um, in an environment that was very jungle-like. And um, I saw trees start to swallow other trees, and just really how things were growing in all sorts of direction. And it reminded me so much of working with fiber, which is something I've done um, since I was a young kid. I learned to embroider in the Girl Scouts, I think. Um, my mom taught me how to crochet, and I just, I think, from the age of like eight, was constantly doing something with fiber, textiles, or whatever. And um, so enter the idea of thinking a lot about color. I, I was working on this series um, called Bark Cloth, where I uh, photographed bark of trees and then printed it on linen, and then I was going back into the linen and embroidering. And I was really thinking about, um, Louise just now was talking about not trusting or feeling comfortable with walk, working with the white um, surface to begin with, the blank page. and. So in a sense, I was thinking about the printed bark as being my blank page and how I could draw on top of that and add color and dimension. And so it made me go back to thoughts about Albert's interaction of color and how certain colors pop when they're next to each other or some colors disappear. And that got me on this whole train of thinking about artists and how painters, how they use color, and how um, 
sometimes you can look at a painting and you say, oh, that's a Matisse, like, because you know the colors, like this guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, I, and uh, Susan Rothenberg uh, with her paintings of horses. Um, and um, I just really started thinking about that. In particular, in the early part, I was looking at Cezanne and Monet and Rock. Um, and um, I found that when I would work with those paintings and cut them up, and sometimes I would get them mixed up. And so I started thinking about um, time periods and how selections of colors or use of color sometimes is time oriented and it has to do with what pigments are available or. I think if you think about us in the 21st century, uh, people in marketing and things like that, that work with, say, cars, they know way in advance what color family the cars in three years are gonna look like. And so I started thinking about the time element that um, is recorded by the way color is used. So, um, all those kind of things um, were part of my curiosity of um, looking uh, and working with these pieces. And um, I loved how um, surprising some things were. Um, for instance, this is a Sean Scully painting whose uh, use of color is use of the lusciousness of the paint. And, um, but still containing it in rectangular shapes, um, whether they're stripes or whatever, um, had always really been seductive for me. But when I cut it up, it, I don't know, it was disappointing in a funny way because um, I had really broken up his way of already breaking up things. And, um, but then there were things that were really a great surprise, like Mary Heilman, how um, her um, painting um, made totally different shapes than the shapes that she already had started with, and um, that was really interesting to me. Um, the other thing, um, you know, I was talking about the essence of time and color, um, this is an El Greco, and um, I, I think if someone hadn't told me that, you know, seeing that weaving, um, I, I don't know if I would have gone back that far in time. Um, and so that was a nice um, investigative revelation to me. <laughs> um, if anyone has a question, I think I'll have to fire away. <laughs> How did you, like, what made you fixate on one particular artist? Like, well, did you think about it ahead of time, like what, what popped up? Um, what, I think initially I was really looking at Cezanne's paintings, because I always look at Cezanne's paintings. Um, I love the way he um, orchestrated color in nature um, in a very new way. Um, that um, kind of reminds me of how I feel I see things when I'm walking and I'm in nature. And um, I think then I, it just led to a, a, like a curiosity realm, you know, I just was following a path of, oh, I wonder what so-and-so's painting would look like. Um, and then I, there were some people who, I couldn't really connect what I thought their colors looked like. Like um, David Sally, I couldn't think of, you know, if I had to like think about what his color palette was. Um, so that led me to kind of go down a little path of um, looking at it. And um, can you tell us? Yeah. Who's who? I mean, I know the Matisse, but you know, oh, now I know the Matisse. Ty Twombly, Sean Scully, Schnabel, Sally, Rothenberg, Rauschenberg. When I get to Rauschenberg, I think that's an interesting thing because, um, I mean, it was interesting to me because I was thinking about how he was this amazing printmaker. 
and um, really experimented um, with materials and way of putting together what we think of as printmaking. And um, I, I kept seeing cyan, yellow, magenta, which are sort of printer's colors. Um, as a photographer, you often know about those four colors. Um, and um, anyway, that, that was like my own inner satisfaction, like thinking about that. Um, this is Mary Howland, um, Jasper Johns. Um, and Jasper Johns was interesting to me because, in a sense, the way he painted um, hatchwork or whatever was kind of weaver-like anyway, so it got to be like a weaving within a weaving. Um, Leger, Matisse. June Artist, just forgot her name. June, June Mitchell, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, how my brain just went. Betty. Betty. Betty Parsons, thank you. Um, El Greco, uh, Gauguin, Eric Fischel, Sonia Delaunay, Brock, and Louise Bourgeois. Um, so this was another painting that was really exciting to me. Um, and uh, I have always admired, um, not always, but for a long time I've um, admired the bold use of color uh, by Sonia Delaunay. Um, usually, you know, you think of it as sort of being big graphic um, partitions in her paintings. And um, so much light seems to come through um, it, even when it's cut up. And um, the way she would use black and white and all those colors um, was really I mean, I love that piece. It feels really alive to me. Laurie, the, the um, demoiselle that you're passing around, um, clearly you did it sideways. You wove it sideways. It's a vertical, and then when you pulled it up, yeah. it's there sideways. Oh. So was there like a, a way that you skewed the work to make it less more abstract, less recognizable, or? No, sometimes it had to do with, was it a vertical painting, was it um, a horizontal, was it square? And um, I mean, I, I think I do know how to steer things to make them do different things. Um, but I tried to be pretty much um, uh, grab out of the bag, kind of. Um, um, before I said that I sewed together the ends, but I, I don't sew together the whole painting. I do like five strips at a time and weave with it. Otherwise, it's very cumbersome um, getting it through the warp. But um, some of them, um, that's a good question, but it doesn't, it's not consistent. Yeah, I was wondering about that with the, with the one on the upper left. There's the blue field mm -hmm. at the top. Was that that was random, or did you? Plan well, sometimes what I do is um, cut the painting, and then I start to take only from the top of the painting, mm -hmm. or only from the bottom of the painting. Um, I think in the one that's going around, I mixed it up pretty much, um, and um, I think you know there's, there's all sorts of little games you play for yourself, with yourself, when you're um, working on something. It's sort of like, well, there's so much blue in that painting, what if I put the blue, I'm not saying that's what I did in this painting, but it's potentially what I was thinking, like, oh, what happens if I put all the blue to the top, will it start to look like a sky? And how um, we culturally see things in terms of water and sky and land and depths and so forth. And um, so, I, I mean, Eric's painting had a lot of water in it, and, um, and it, it was a diptych, I think. Does that sound like right, Eric? Sweet. Is that I didn't sweet? even know I was up there until the end. I like it when I can confuse I believe these are extremely successful. I believe each one would be brilliantly successful if you just did work large. Just take one, 
work large, you might have to job it out to give them the directions what to do. Because mm -hmm. this is really fabulous, fabulous idea. They're great thumbnail sketches. Well, go big. <laughs> or go home. <laughs> <laughs> I think they'd be really fab, really terrific. Thank you. Now, what was what your first? You, what do you think the, uh, uh, would be enhanced by going big? What, what would that do, add to it? You would allow the viewer to step into them. All painters worry about this. We worry about getting air into the, the, the composition or the you know, visuals. You, you, allow, you worry about how the viewer is going to see it, how engaged. And I'm not talking about marketplace, I'm talking about just the primitive viewer. Mm -hmm. So the, some of these are not allowing me in. <laughs> this is easy. This is an easy one because mm -hmm. we see you, you let you, you right. worked on with the bodies, of course, the air of a head, the, the water of Eric's, this, this fabulous little detail. So these details, you just, you, what is it, like earth or whatever, see? And this blue, this mm -hmm. greenish. So if that was that, you know, that was big, we would all be allowed to step in and really engage in your your vision, and your talent. You know, your talent is tremendous. Well, I, I think it's kind of what Louise was hinting at, where you're just not finished. Like, <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm always thinking. Of, for me, it's very important to work with my hands. Um, and um, after so much time um, in the last 20 years of working on a computer it, and um, images that lived on a screen, um, being able to touch and have a tactile sensation and think also um, about the sense of emotion or memory that touch um, entails is really important to me. Um, so I feel that I'm constantly trying to take something visual and, and make it physical. And um, that issue in me is not finished yet. I'm not resolved. It's not resolved. And, um, but that said, it is something that certainly I think about making it large, but you know, we need the cathedral, not the church. I'm really taken by the work. It's beautiful, and I love your process. And what I find incredibly interesting in it is that basically you've taken an iconic image, you've virtually shattered it apart, but the net result is so full of like an element of surprise of freshness and I think the to the point of making them larger I think it just allows for the viewers journey to spend even more time and, and relate to what you've done so mm -hmm. really um, well thank you so much Elizabeth um, I um, you know part of this has started to make me think about mosaic too because mm -hmm. of obvious reasons um, because of the little squares that created but um, I think that um, in a sense these are all kind of things I think about when I'm working um, in different phases but um, I think about how um, we respond to what we like and we don't like because let's say because of color and uh, what colors we're attracted to or what balance what balance of color, or in, including that balance of light and dark. And um, so by taking well-received paintings um, and um, breaking them up, I realize for the most part they're still really satisfying because they still have that balance of light and color. And um, that, for me, was like a wonderful thing to kind of feel and um, realize. Hi, Terry. I also like seeing them all together mm -hmm. and how they can play together. I mean, I, I could see things larger and I understand the power of that, but I'm really enjoying how they work together and mm -hmm. the different colors and, you know, talk to each other and pick up different parts of light and dark. Well, um, that was another thing that, I mean, I can be 
humorously cynical and, and say, like, oh, I took all these great paintings by well-known painters and made them all the same size. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, Which think, only affects Julian. <laughs> Um, you know, that was kind of um, a, a fun thing too, um, but yeah, I think, um, I agree with you, it's exciting yeah. to have them talk to each other. Yeah. I don't understand the very beginning of the process, which um, you, decide, you decide first, okay, I'd like to do a Picasso, and then you find the print that you like, and then you put that print on linen. Is this... So kind far, of. right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then I, from there I understand. And then I break it apart. Right, no, that, <laughs> that part I understand. And it's pretty Lori, are you photographing the demoiselles out, out of a print or, or book or something? Or are you, it, how, it, how do you It get depends. If I can find, uh, the last time I went to the Museum of Modern Art was probably not that long ago. It was when the Red Room, um, uh, Matisse's painting was, um, displayed. I probably went through the museum in 45 minutes and I took so many paintings, uh, photographs of paintings that my iPhone said, uh -uh, done. And um, so I love it when I can photograph the painting myself, um, but sometimes I do go online. Your painting I went online to find. Um, April I was all ready to do your painting that was downstairs, the last show. And the last day it was there, there were so many people standing in front of me. <laughs> I thought, I'll come back tomorrow. And I came back tomorrow, and the painting was gone. Carrie, Carrie, take <laughs> Next time. <laughs> um, Lori, I'm noticing the edges, mm -hmm. um, and I think they add so much. And I'm just wondering, was that a practical matter to make them, you know, kind of bend, or? Was that um, an artistic choice? Plus the little tails you've left. Right. Um, in a sense, I love referring back to the idea that it's an object. Um, and um, the edges, um, because I've been weaving for a long time and also working with cut up things, I realized that that was like a really nice way to contain it. And um, I decided to use it in these paintings because I thought it was, it kind of sealed the deal for me. It just felt good. Is it the same principle of like when you were using bubblegum wrappers and then you would weave them together? <laughs> yeah. and probably, little, probably. You know this little triangle? Yeah. 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 Does anyone know how to have well, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> The thing is that, like that um, the linen is always only printed on one side, and if I didn't carefully fold it, the white of the fabric shows through. Right. And it would happen in such a random way, and for me, it looked unresolved. So, is there? Can you generalize about whether there's a difference between using an abstract image or a figural one? Could you break? Well, I think that's kind of a surprise. Uh, um, um, well, certainly this was an abstract painting, but. It had a horse, right, an abstract horse in it. And I love the idea that it still feels like motion to me, even mm -hmm. though you don't see the animal anymore. Um, but you let it do that, like as opposed to the Matisse where you made the dancers all kind of falling down. <laughs> <laughs> they fell down on their own. They, uh, they, they became swimmers. <laughs> <laughs> No, but it's, it goes back to that question that someone had asked about, like, how do you determine, like, like the Mary Heilman still looks like a Mary Heilman yes. to me, yeah. but the Susan Rothenberg, I didn't guess, and, I mean, maybe other people are like, Susan Rothenberg, yeah. it's, 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 that's a really interesting question, because you do have a lot of power of, um, in your rearranging, mm -hmm. as to, like, what sort of effect you make it have, like, the bottom, right, is that, what did you say that was? That doesn't look like Saitwambly to me at all, but I love the, I mean, just because I don't know the reference, but I love the way that it 
it has this falling down. It's one of those falling. paintings that's all mm -hmm. circular mm -hmm. gestures. Okay. And so I, for me, it became like really contained and more solid. And I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, it was exciting for me to see what happened in that one. And I, I think um, too. I'm sorry, I don't remember her name. You said that it would be nice to see one big, like one. I guess if you wanted to make one big, some of them suggest to me suggest like a larger scale as a kind of an, a physical experience because I mean besides agreeing with you 100% about the physicality of work and making things by hand, I also think scale is a really critical thing in experiencing a work of art. And some of these, I think, would be um, powerful in a different way, let's just say, mm -hmm. if they were larger. And if you could experience <coughs> like, the, the, like the movement of that one on a larger scale, I think we have a different impact than it does when it is in a body of work like this, as pleasant as it is to look back and forth on them, it would be it would be interesting to see like what would happen in kind of a, a whole cascade of those colors. Right, right, right. You know, physically inhabiting a similar space as our bodies, for instance. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think it would have to be St. John's. St. John's. <laughs> <laughs> That's a pretty big wall down there. <laughs> but um, Just this but it's wall. it's. They ask so many interesting questions. That's one of the things that I love about this piece is that um, once you kind of get into knowing who they are and, and then see, like taking the time to really look at them individually, there are a lot of, um, they make their own suggestions, I think. You've done a lot of portraits as a photographer and it reminds me of a long-term extension of portraiture. You know, you can only take a flat surface so long if you're taking portraits, and pretty soon you want to sculpturize the surface. And it just seems like this is, could almost be seen as a contact sheet of portraits. Um, and it's, it's a really bold rejection of old time photography. I got to hand it to you. <laughs> you really did it this time. It's just great. And I, I think, uh, I think a big, a big portrait would only just be revelatory to your process, mm -hmm. and for that alone, it should be done, you know. But but it really is a tribute to the subjects, mm -hmm. and it is photographic that way, you know. We can't stay the same, right? Right. Thanks. Well, one thing um, I was thinking about that your comment triggered in my brain um, is many of you probably know that I photographed in Roy Lichtenstein's studio extensively. And for me, this work is kind of like a continuation of thoughts that I had when I, I was able to take Roy's uh, subjects, his, um, his materials, and photograph them and make something new of them. And I feel, in a sense, here I'm taking a completed thing that someone's made and letting us see it differently and or myself seeing it differently and experiencing it differently and um i i, I loved when i was driving the car the other day and i was really thinking about the work at roy studio and how um it related I mean, it's just a sideline <laughs> yeah but i want to touch them <laughs> right. I, I have one question. I mean, you've been doing this now for two, since 2016. How has this influenced some of your other work? Um, well, I, I think how I initially started it was thinking about color in regards to how I use color or how I might choose color. So, yes, it, it has. Um, I rem it's not here, but I remember distinctly looking at some of Jack Emberman's paintings. And um, some of you may know he did these paintings where there are little dashes of color that alternate, like three or four colors. And for me, it was very stitch-like with embroidery. And um, so sometimes, quite literally, um, or actually, I'm influenced. It's kind of like I 
get to taste them, you know, like if you're cooking or something. <laughs> Perhaps one more question. Tony. Me? Um, just incredibly beautiful, Lori. Um, just as a counterpoint to the go large, uh, not that it's either or, but I find uh, that it, the additive process of the smaller works, that, that aggregate nature of that, to be very exciting and the building of something from smaller parts. So to me, that, that holds tremendous energy and excitement. Um, also, you know, when I went to see the Jasper Johns show that was at the Whitney, there was a room that had these tiny little drawings, and you had to really get up close with them and be intimate with them. It was a very different experience in that room than the, the rest of the work. And, you know, mm -hmm. it was both work and it was both powerful. But I loved being drawn into, like, needing to be close to the, to the work. Well, I would like to thank you, Laurie. I'd like to thank you.